The last four weeks, our last three weeks, we've been in a series. This is our fourth week in a series called More Than This, where we talk about how do we live a life with intentional purpose. In the first week, we talked about the way that you live with purpose is to seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus said that we're called to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things that we find the, our lives running after will be given to us as well. And so if you truly want to live a life of purpose, you got to seek first God and his kingdom. Pursue Jesus. The second week we talked about the interaction that Jesus had with the woman at the well and how when she came in contact with Jesus, her, her identity was changed, her life was changed. She went from being a lady of the night to a woman of the light representing God in a powerful way and how when we encounter Jesus, he changes us. And that is where purpose is found, is in relationship with him. And then last week, uh, of course, we talked about how often we have the tendency to lose our identity. On the journey of life, things happen, difficulties come our way, and we look up and we find ourselves disconnected from God, losing the identity that we have in Jesus, trying to fulfill our life with other things rather than with Christ. Well, today we're going to continue that conversation, and we're going to talk about the life of a guy named David. He's an Old Testament character. He was the king of Israel, and it's just such a powerful story as you look at the life of David. Now, I will warn you, I'm going to cover this at about 10,000 feet, so I'm not going to be able to get into all the minute details. I'm probably going to do a series uh, at some point next year, 2019, on David. Uh, but as we reflect on the life of David, I really believe God will help give us some clarity on how to live with purpose because David had a life that had ups and downs, just like my life, just like your life. Actually, as I was thinking back over the last 19 years of following Jesus, and I thought, you know, there's been a lot of times that have been up, but there's been some times that have been down. There's been times on the journey where I was pursuing God and times on the journey where I wasn't pursuing God as much. You know what I'm talking about? We all have those seasons of ups and downs. Some of those were self-created problems and some were outside of my control, but we've all had those seasons. There's been those seasons of great success in my life, but there's also been some seasons of great regret. There's been seasons of big faith where I trusted God for the impossible, but there's also been seasons in life where I hid from God. There's been seasons in life where I was thankful and lived with humility, but there's been seasons where I lived with a lot of pride. There's been seasons in this journey where I've had incredible joy, but there's been seasons where I've had a broken spirit. So what about you? Each one of us on this journey of life, of following God, of trying to live in a way that honors God and it lives with purpose. We have ups, we have downs, we have seasons that we're grateful for and that we're thankful for and we have seasons that we regret and seasons that have broken us. We've all had those wins and we've had those losses. So how do we stay on the journey? How do we continue to pursue God? Thinking about a lot of you high school seniors, you're taking this new journey, this new step in life. How do you stay on track with God? Because there's a lot of things that are going to be coming at you. How do you continue to live a life with purpose? So what about your life today? Are you in a season that's up? Are you in a season that's down? What's going on with your life? As we look at the life of David today, David has this incredible testimony. He has a life that pursued the heart of God, a life that was after the heart of God, but he had ups and he had downs. But one of the things I love about David is in Acts chapter 13, this is in the New Testament. Now, David, David was an Old Testament guy. So this is about a thousand years after the life of David, uh, Paul who wrote much of the New Testament, known as the Apostle Paul, he, he talks about Jesus being uh, the Messiah coming to rescue us, and he references the life of David, and he gives David uh, a great uh, testimony here. He says in Acts 13, 36, he says, Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep or, or he died. He was buried with his ancestors and his body Decayed. He was talking about how Jesus' body doesn't decay and that Jesus overcame death. But when you look at this statement about David, it's a powerful statement. He says that David served God's purpose for his own generation. Now, we all have ups and we all have downs. But there's nothing greater that could be said of you in your life than that you served God's purpose in your life for this generation. 
Do you feel like right now your life is on a track where you're fulfilling the purpose of God in your life? And you know, the most beautiful thing about the church is the church is this mosaic. It's like this, this picture of so many different people from all places, all nations, all walks of life, all different backgrounds, all different types of families, all different types of careers. But we're all on the same journey to live a life that honors God and, to bring, and, that, and that has eternal purpose. So the way that you and I fulfill our purposes is unique to who we are, the way God's wired us, our family, uh, and and, and everything, kind of the whole package. But as you take evaluation of that, as you think about your life, are you living a life with intentional purpose? Will something like that be said of you that you serve God's purpose in your generation? David was an unlikely man to become king. But God does the impossible with the unlikely, right? It's an interesting thing when you say the life of David because David is referred to by most as the greatest king of Israel. He was an incredible warrior. He was an incredible leader. He did incredible things in his life. And so today as we take this snapshot of David, I want to kind of paint the picture for you because David, when he comes on the scene, he is just this young shepherd boy in Bethlehem the father of a man named Jesse, he had eight, he, had, he was the youngest brother, he had eight other brothers, he was the youngest of eight brothers, and at that time in history, David's um, was, the king of Israel at that time was a man named Saul, and um, Saul had disobeyed God, and when Saul disobeyed God, God removed his blessing in his hand from the life of Saul and would seek out to find a new king. And so I'm gonna kind of give you an overview of the life of David. I've broken this down into nine different segments. Now we could get into a lot more detail or less detail or whatever, but this is what we're gonna cover today. The first thing I want you to see in the overview of the life of David and how this relates to us, and you're gonna see it when we get to the end of this, is Saul is king, but God says that he has called one after his heart. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13 and 14, this is when Saul had disobeyed what God had told him to do, and this is what the scripture says. Samuel is the prophet of that time, okay, that's giving direction to the king. 1 Samuel 13, 13 and 14 says, you have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, uh, the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. If you wouldn't have done this, Saul, you would have been the king of all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commands. Now, at this point in history, David is a young man, probably 10, 11, 12, maybe 13 years old, very, very young, at least from our mindset. And the second thing that happens after this is Samuel is sent on a mission by God to go find the future king. And he ends up in Bethlehem at uh, the house of Jesse. And he's thinking, okay, which brother is it going to be? And of course, God will reveal to the prophet Samuel that David, this young, probably 12 or 13-year-old boy, the little runt of the family, would be the future king. And we pick that up in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 and 8. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now we're going to jump to verse 13 when he, when he anoints David, who God shows him is supposed to be the future king. He says, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, check this out, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. So I want to kind of paint this picture for you. Here this great King Saul has failed God, has has disobeyed the plan that God had, and now God has sent Samuel the prophet to find a new king who would take over. Now David wouldn't take over at this point, but David is just this young boy. And his brothers are probably sitting around like, what's going on? Why not me? Why are you picking the runt here? But God had a plan, and God was looking for someone 
who was after his own heart. Now, I think about this with so many teenagers here. This, this, this guy was 12 or 13, and God would choose him. I mean, what does God want to do in your life? It doesn't matter your age, how old or young you are. God has a purpose for your life. The question you have to ask yourself, is my heart in tune with God? Am I pursuing the things of God? Am I hungry after God? Well, David had a heart for God. And we were kind of joking around about this in the office this week. I had Hardy and PJ, and I was telling them about the sermon a little bit. And we were like, you know, David was such a unique guy because we're about to see where he kills Goliath. I'm about to cover that in a minute. So he was this incredible warrior, and then he became this great warrior. But he was also this really incredible musician. Because one of the things I'm not going to dive into too much, but when Saul uh, disobeyed God, the Bible says that God removed his hand from Saul and began to torment him. And so the king, uh, Saul, was being tormented by an evil spirit, and he was literally going nuts. And David was this incredible heart player, and, and Saul had found out about this, and so Saul sent for David to come, and David would come and play harp. That was like the electric guitar nowadays, okay? He would play the harp. <laughs> he would play the harp for Saul, and it would calm Saul down because he was just being tormented because he had disobeyed God, and he had gone in the wrong direction. And so he knew who David was, and David had brought comfort to him. And so we were like, you know, who is a modern-day picture of an incredible warrior but yet incredible musician? And so here's who we came up with. Yeah. You like that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so Hugh Jackman, he can rip your face off with his claws, or he can dance and sing with the best of them, okay? The greatest showman. That's kind of a joke, but, you know, David was this unique guy. He was, he was a man's man, but he was this incredible artist. He wrote most of the Psalms in the Old Testament. I mean, just an incredible, unique guy that God would use. And here David is, this young boy who would be anointed as king. Well, a couple years had probably passed, and David was probably about 15 years old, and there was this giant who was coming after the Israelite army, and he was a Philistine, the enemy of Israel, and he was calling them out, bring me your greatest warrior. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to take him out, and they were scared to death, but there was a young man who was after the heart of God who believed God was bigger than the giant that stood in front of him, and little David comes out, and we're going to pick up and 1 Samuel chapter 17. So now David is about 15 years old, and David is standing in front of this giant, and David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and, javelin, and spear and javelin, but I come against you, check this out, in the name of the Lord Almighty. David believed God for the impossible. He believed God for the impossible. He said, the God of, the, uh, uh, the God of armies of Israel whom you have defiled. Goliath had defiled the army of God, and, and, and David says in verse 46, this day, is the, this, uh, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down, and I'm cutting your head off. I mean, these are some strong words coming from this little 15-year-old dude who's like, I'm about to take you out. I mean, all these other warriors that were with Israel were not like little shrimps. I mean, they were, they were men. They had fought in battle. And here this young 15-year-old boy steps up to the plate and says, I'm going to handle this. It wasn't because he was the greatest fighter. It was because he had a heart after God. And he believed that God could do anything. Of course, we know the result is he takes the stone and he smokes him in the head right in the temple, kills him, chops his head off. And when he does that, Saul, who is king, goes, hey, I don't want you to just come play harp when I feel bad. I actually want you to be at my house all the time and to be a warrior for me. And so David then would go and he would be at Saul's, uh, part of Saul's uh, kingdom, and he would fight for Saul and, and win incredible battles. So after he defeats Goliath, he becomes one of Saul's warriors. And the fourth thing I want you to see kind of in the journey of David is after that happens, King Saul becomes jealous of David's success in battle. So when you read 1 Samuel chapter 18, he becomes jealous. And remember, jealous, jealousy drives to crazy. And that's exactly what happened with King Saul. 
The scripture says this in chapter 18, verse 5 through 9 of 1 Samuel. Whatever mission, uh, whatever mission Saul sent him on, King Saul sent David on, uh, was so successful that Saul gave him high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and, Saul, uh, and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the, woman came, uh, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul and singing and dancing with joyful songs with timbers and lyres. I mean, they were having a great time. In verse 7 it says, and they danced, they sang. Check this out. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Notice what happens next in verse 8. It says, Saul was, so, was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They had credited David with tens of thousands, he thought. But me with only thousands, what more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Now at this point, David is probably in his early 20s. He's become a strong man. He's a great fighter. He's defeating the enemy. And, and Saul is completely cool with that as long as he's getting all the credit and praise. But when David starts getting the praise of tens of thousands of men being slain and Saul only thousands, Saul gets really worked up. Saul gets really jealous. Saul gets really angry. And he starts to keep his eye on David, which ultimately, if you continue to read in the next chapter, he set out to kill David. So Saul tries to kill David multiple times. 1 Samuel 19, 1 and 2, Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and he warned him. They became very close friends and, and Jonathan, the very son of the king, warned David, my father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Now during this time period, this is about when David was probably about 25 to 35 years old. So for 10 years, David is on the run. David is running, making sure that he doesn't get killed by King Saul. He's hiding out. He's, he's having to live on the run. Now, David has been faithful to God. He's, he's trusted God. He saw God do impossible things. And now, after being faithful and, and fighting for the king, the king has turned his back on him and wants him killed. And while he's running during this 10-year period, a lot of things happened. But there were multiple times that David snuck up and could have killed Saul. He could have ended it. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, if somebody's tracking me down and I get a chance to kill you, you're dead. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you're trying to kill me for 10 years, I'm killing you. And David has multiple chances to kill Saul, but every time he lets him live. And it's a picture that Saul, I mean, David trusted God's plan. See, oftentimes in my life and in your life, you know what we want to do? We want to take control. We want to get ahead of God. We want to get ahead of the plan of God because we think we know better. And I don't know about you, but if I was in David's shoes and for 10 years I'd been living with this torment and this crazy dude was trying to kill me, I would have wanted to step ahead of God and take control. But instead, David allows him to live. David doesn't kill him. He has multiple chances to take him out, to end this problem in his life. But David is a man after the heart of God, and he trusts God's plan. 25 to 35-ish years old, he's on this journey, <clears throat> journey for 10 years until ultimately, as you get to the end of 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel, the Israelites are at war, and eventually Saul's evil acts catch up with him, and he dies. And then David would become king. So David waited on the plan of God, and now he's about 35-ish years old, and he has become king. And over the next 20 years of the life of David, I mean, amazing things happen. If you read the book of, of 2 Samuel, those early chapters, you see after David becomes king, he brings the ark of God into Jerusalem and, and makes it the city of David. And the people are so thrilled and excited, and God is moving, and they're having victory after victory. And it's just unbelievable success in the life of David as he trusts God and pursues God and God is just blessing his efforts one after another after another. But you know what happens in life oftentimes after we have a lot of success, right? 
we take our eye off the ball. Success oftentimes can lead to laziness or complacency. And in the life of David, that's what happened. After about 20 years, David is probably about 55 years old. He's been fighting a lot of battles. He's been winning a lot. He's had a lot of success. He's been pursuing God. But then he has an affair with a, a woman named Bathsheba. Now, I don't know if you realized it or not, but you may have thought, well, David was probably like 25 and not thinking straight when that happened. No, no, he was 55 years old. He literally has a midlife crisis. I don't know what happened behind the scenes and what all developed into this, but David took his mind off of God and his heart out of alignment with God. And the enemy, anytime you take your hand off the reins and you kick back, the enemy will come attacking. And that's revealed to us as you read 2 Samuel 11, verse 1 through 4. Check out what the scripture says, y'all. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. So in the spring, when kings go off to war, this is part of the culture at this time. David is the king. He should be going off to war and doing what he does. David doesn't do that. David sent Joab, it continues in that verse, Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Amorites and besieged Rabbi. But David remained in Jerusalem. He neglected his king responsibilities. He neglected the responsibilities that God had given him, and it's about to backfire on him. Now, I just want to pause there for a minute because I think this is really important for us. Now, none of us are going to physical war right now. Now, so we do have a lot of military who at some point might be, but not in this same way necessarily. But we are in spiritual war. And we have been given as Jesus people, as Christ followers, a mission. And that mission is to spread the good news of Jesus with our neighbors and the nations, to tell people about what God has done in our lives. Let me ask you, have you taken your eye off the ball? Have you neglected your responsibility? God saved you for a purpose. God didn't save you so you could sit. God saved you so you could share. Are you sharing what God's done in your life? Because when we neglect our responsibility, the enemy wedges his way in as fast as you're, I mean, it's just so fast. Because notice what happens. As David is supposed to be out at war, he's chilling at the house. Verse two says, one evening David got out of his bed and he walked around on the roof of his palace. And I just want to pause there because if you ever go to Jerusalem, it's, it's pretty hilly. And so there's a good chance that his house was on top of the hill looking across. And, and they used their rooftops and they would bathe and do all these things on the rooftop. So this is, if you ever go, you'll kind of see this. One evening David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of his palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. Uh-oh, should be at war. Instead, getting exposed to something that the enemy's setting up, the woman was very beautiful. Of course she was. Of course she was. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. After 50 years of faithfulness. Well, even if you want to go to 12 years, almost 40 years of pursuing the heart of God, anointed as a young boy to be king, believing God for the impossible, trusting God, seeing God slay giants, seeing God defeat the enemy, seeing God make him king, seeing God be faithful in the midst of his trials when Saul would try to kill him, but yet he would continue to trust God, seeing God's faithfulness over and over and over and over again. And here he is. And one slip up, and the enemy gets him. And David would fall into this sin. And just like us, David wouldn't just go, oh my gosh, I messed up. Let, let, me, let, you know, let, me, let me get this right. No, 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 David tried to hide it. <laughs> you know? Are we not awesome at that? I mean, we commit one sin and we go, oh no, 
I messed up now. I got to hide this. I got to figure out how to make sure nobody finds out about this. And if you continue to read, that's what David does. David realizes what he's done, and he wants to make sure that her husband comes back. And he brings her husband back and tries to get her husband to go sleep with her. So that, it, that when she's pregnant, it won't be his, you know, nobody will know it's mine, but the husband won't do it because he is faithful to his call, which is war. And David ultimately says, well, I'm gonna have to take this guy out. So he puts him on the front line and has him ultimately killed. David, as Uriah killed in the battle, 2 Samuel 11, 26 and 27 says, when Uriah's wife had heard of her, hu her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David, brought her, uh, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. I want you to hear this next part. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Don't think that you're too old for God not to get you. But you know what is so amazing about our God? What's so good about our God? Because we can all relate Maybe you hadn't had an affair like this, but may, you, you've had some mistakes you've made. You've, you've had your failures. You've had your ups. You've had your rock bottom bads. And you wonder, how can I keep living for God? How can I have any more purpose? It's because God is gracious. It's because God is merciful. It is because God is forgiving and good. You see, David would obviously have to pay the consequences because He's in his mid-50s when this happens. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if you continue to read the story, the next 20 years are pretty bad. The rest of David's life is pretty bad. He has family members killing each other. There's a three-year famine. There's all kinds of bad stuff that happens. They're the, the repercussions of his sins, the consequences. Listen, when we sin, there are consequences. There just are. But you know what's so amazing? is even though there are earthly consequences for our sin, when we come to God with a humble heart and a repentive spirit and we bow down before the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, and we ask him to have mercy on us and forgive us, you know what he does? He receives us. He forgives us. He accepts us. He loves us. And that's what David does. David repents of his sin. I told you David wrote many of the Psalms and one of the Psalms that really paints the picture of his brokenness over this sin is Psalm 51, one and two. It's, so David writes and he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, remove them, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He goes on in verse 10 and 12 and he said, 10 through 12, and he says, create in me, a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not, cast, uh, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. When he's saying that word, I have to believe he's thinking about Saul. When Saul had disobeyed God, that's exactly what happened. And David's crying out, Lord, verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Now, David is before the cross. David is looking before the cross for, for God to send the rescuer. We are on the other side of the cross and we are waiting for the rescuer to return again. He's already come. But David, he called out to God and he asked for forgiveness. And I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you've been, but your life and my life are just like the life of David. We have a lot of successes and we have a lot of failures. We have ups, we have downs. But most of all, we need the grace and forgiveness of our God. And let me tell you some good news today. What Jesus Christ did for you through his life, he lived the life that you can't live. You see, he kept the laws of God flawlessly and perfectly, and that's impossible for you to do. But he did it for you. The death that you deserve for not keeping those laws, Jesus said, no, I'm gonna take your place. And he died on the cross. And he took the penalty of your sin and my sin on himself. But he didn't even stop there. He overcame death so that we don't have to experience the true penalties for our sin, which is eternal separation from the creator God. But Jesus overcame the grave so that we could have eternal life in his son by faith through repentance. 
as you think about your life today, have you repented to God? Have you called on the name of Jesus to save you? You see, 20 years would go past and David's life would have a lot of struggles, but ultimately, like all of us, David died. And David would make Solomon king, his son. And his son would build the temple and continue the legacy of David. And I want to read Acts 13, 36 one more time to you. It says, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, this is a thousand years after all this happened, he fell asleep and he was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. You see, David's life was after the heart of God. I want you to see these four things to kind of tie all this together. David believed God could do it. When he stood before Goliath, he believed God could do it. When he was being chased down by Saul, he believed God would protect him. When he could have killed Saul, he, he trusted in God's plan and he believed God would take care of it. Do you believe that God can do it? He, he not only believed God could do it, he trusted God in the trials. David had some great trials in his life and difficulties on the journey, but he continued to trust God in the midst of those trials. He, he loved the word of God. He wrote so many of the Psalms out of a heart of love for God. He trusted God in the trials. He lived a thankful life. He had things that were difficult that he went through. His life wasn't all cupcakes and ding-dongs. It was tough. There were difficulties. But he trusted God in the ups and the downs. And ultimately, and most importantly, he repented to God for his failure. That's a man after the heart of God. That's a woman after the heart of God. And so let me ask you, do you believe that God can do it? I don't know what it is in your life, but do you believe God can? What is your Goliath? What is the struggle who is the Saul in your life that's trying to hunt you down? Do you believe God can? Will you trust God in the trials? I don't know what you're up against, but will you trust him in the midst of your struggle? Will you live a thankful life? You know, it's so easy to live negative. We live in a negative world. But to choose that I am a child of God saved by Jesus Christ and my eternity is not based on the circumstances that surround me, but it's based on my standing with Christ. I will live a thankful life. And will you repent to God for your failures? Because 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Is your heart committed to him? You know what's so good to tell you today? Is it's not something you have to do to earn it. It's simply surrender. It's recognizing your need for what God has offered if today you want to begin that relationship with Jesus, he's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for authentic, surrendered, available people. He's looking for you. He loves you. I don't care what you've done. He loves you, and he can forgive you. He did enough through his life, through the cross, and through the resurrection to forgive the most heinous thing you've ever done and to accept you into his family and love you. So if that's you today, I want you to pray with me. I want to ask you all to bow your heads. Let's pray together. Listen, there's no magical prayer or anything, but the Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And some of you need to be saved today. You need to be saved right now because if you do not accept Jesus, you will be forever separated from God. He is the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If that's you today, I want you to pray with me, something like this. Lord, today I recognize I need you. Lord, today I confess I am a sinner. Lord, I have failed in my life. And I need forgiveness. I'm asking you to accept me, Lord. I'm asking you to forgive me. Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for letting me in your family. In Jesus' name, amen.